commissioning week. The Naval Academy, Annapolis. Brigade Commander Jeff Royal, the highest ranking midshipman of his graduating class, leads today's Navy into tomorrow. World War II veterans Lorenzo Dufour and James Graham served in yesterday's Navy, where segregation was the rule, and Jim Crow called the cadence. Most black sailors were relegated to duties as cooks or waiters or shorebound laborers. There was a sign on the fleet that battled for freedom. It said, whites only. Except for one ship and one crew of 160 men. Their ship, the USS Mason DE-529, the first and the only World War II U.S. Navy warship manned by a predominantly African-American crew. This is the story they never told before. Proudly we serve. The men of the Mason performed all the specialized duties necessary to take a modern warship into battle. They escorted six convoys across a fierce North Atlantic, made even more treacherous by German U-boats. The skill of these young sailors, their courage under fire, their dogged determination, and the camaraderie that sustained them helped to blast away barriers and to push the U.S. military toward full integration. Thousands of black officers and enlisted personnel have followed in their wake, and yet history has forgotten the USS Mason. Why was this song kept a secret? Is... <laughs> That's a very good question. You'd have to go back in history about 50 years. March 20th, 1944, Charleston Navy Yard, Boston, another commissioning ceremony. The mother of Ensign Newton Mason, a young Navy pilot shot down during the Battle of the Coral Sea, christens the ship named for her son, the USS Mason Destroyer Escort 529. It was one of the hundreds of these specially designed anti-submarine vessels rushed into production to provide some protection for the great convoys of troop and supply ships setting out to liberate Europe from the Nazis. DEs were fast, maneuverable, heavily armed, and expendable. Built in weeks, not years, expected to last no more than six months these little ships served on the front lines of the Battle of the Atlantic. When Hitler's armies crushed Europe, an isolated Britain depended on supplies from North America for her very survival. But in 1941, the Nazis ruled the seas. Winston Churchill would later write, the one thing I really feared during the war was the U-boat. When the United States joined the fight, the first victory had to be victory at sea. Destroyer escorts joined the battle. Their mission, to shepherd the ships loaded with fuel, weapons, and machinery across that wide and cruel ocean. Sometimes these convoys carried U.S. servicemen and women. Then vigilance doubled, troop ships were the Germans' most prized kill, and every DE sailor understood the unspoken order. We take the torpedo, save the big ship. We are 200 men, they are 10,000. The uh, escort commander could tell the destroyer escort to get between the ship that should have been hit and the torpedo and take the hit ourselves, because first of all, we had fewer men, we were a smaller ship, and it was important that the larger ship uh, survive, so that could happen. 
The young sailors heard their captain, William Blackford, read directions from Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox. Immediately after her shaking down period, the USS Mason will be assigned to duty wherever she is then most needed. You will proceed directly into combat. Your first action may be by day or by night against any type of vessel or aircraft possessed by our able and ruthless enemies. Captain Blackford added his own words. You have been selected to man the USS Mason on the basis of previous meritorious service. Now the real job is beginning. He thanked the shipbuilders, many of them black, who watched from a distance. A writer for the Atlanta Daily News, an African-American newspaper, observed those workers too. There was a moistness in the eyes of some of the colored workers who with their white comrades braved the bitter cold to witness the ceremony. This was something they had helped fashion with their own hands to be manned by their own boys. The politicians knew this ship was important. Governor Salton Stahl of Massachusetts and Mayor Tobin of Boston attended. Julian D. Steele, president of the local NAACP, presented the crew with musical instruments. It was a time to strike up the band. After years of pressure from the African-American community, black sailors were going to sea. Some saw it as too little, too late, but the crew were proud of their ship, with its special tracking systems, radar, sonar, Doppler. Scientists provided the theory for these inventions. Now they would make them work as they went out to defeat the enemy below. Black Americans wanted to serve, but they were determined that the experience of World War I not be repeated. Black soldiers then had fought valiantly overseas. The 369th Regiment fought on the enemy fire for 191 days. The French government of Dallas and the soldiers are brave. But they marched home to face a reborn Ku Klux Klan. Birth of the Nation, which celebrated the Klan's beginning, was shown in the White House and hailed by President Wilson as history writ with lightning. Why help white America win another war? if the lofty principles of democracy defended abroad were ignored at home. African-American leaders found a powerful ally. Mrs. Roosevelt, the president's wife, and Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, both were personal friends. My being a personal friend to Dr. Bethune, that's how the I am the third party in this group, because as long as I live, and I'm 97 years old now, I'm still gonna fight for to do away with segregation. Because why should I hate you just because your skin is white? And you certainly have no right to hate me because my skin is black. Such voices persuaded President Roosevelt to mandate some changes in the military. Volunteers poured into the army. Joe Lewis had just defeated Max Schmeling, Hitler's favorite boxer. He led the way. The army was still segregated and black companies kept from combat. But African Americans were commissioned as officers. Units such as the Tuskegee Airmen and the Armored Tank Battalion were formed, but the Navy resisted change. 
even though service by African Americans was an integral part of its tradition. In the Revolutionary War, black men fought in USC battles. Oliver Perry said, the African Americans who served in the War of 1812 were among my best men. 30,000 black sailors served on the Union side in the Civil War. Robert Smalls of Beaufort, South Carolina, pilot on the armed Confederate wheel transport, the Planter, took over the ship and presented it to the Union Navy as a prize of war. African Americans went down with the USS Maine, but a century of service was forgotten when Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, sent his great white fleet around the world. Serving African American petty officers were transferred to shore duty or discharged. In 1919, the Navy stopped all black enlistment. After Pearl Harbor, African Americans who applied to the Siemens branch were turned away, even as the Navy decorated Stewart's mate, Dory Miller, for his heroism at Pearl Harbor. Men in the Stewart's branch were capable and served bravely, but the issue was equality. Finally, on June 1, 1942, pressured by civil rights groups and stretched to the limit by the Two Ocean War, the Navy opened all rates to qualified African Americans. Dury Miller, killed in action, became a recruiting poster. James Graham recalls his enlistment. We told him that uh, we wouldn't cook and we wouldn't clean behind anyone and this and that. And he told us that uh, we could go in and the uh, same foot in with the white guys in the seamen branch. So we jumped for it. The recruiting officer told me I had a choice of going in then as a mess attendant or a uh, member of the construction battalion, CBs. But he also told me if I waited six weeks, I could come in on the same basis as uh, anybody else did. Uh, all enlistments would be open for, for blacks as it were for anybody else. So I waited six weeks and entered the service as an apprentice seaman. I had no, I had no idea that if I'd have went in at that time, I would have been a steward. I didn't understand what blacks were doing in the Navy. It made a difference. I was just going to join up to fight for the country. That, that was in my head. I'm patriot. What do you want to be, a cook? I said, no, man. Don't, didn't you know that we can, I can go in there with any rank now? President Roosevelt, that's the only reason I'm here. I know I can. I don't want to be a cook. I don't cook for myself. When I went in, I don't know what I'm in for because I was born and raised in New York. I have no idea this color line or anything like that. And I went downtown to get in the group. They had about 250 white sailors down there and about 15 to 18 of us black sailors down there. And they said they wanted us to swear in. Swearing in time came. And the very first thing has all you colored over there in the back. And that was the first day I heard that. And I started thinking, what is this? This, you know, something's wrong here. So when they gave the uh, speech about, uh, oh, swearing in ceremony, I mouthed it. I was so mad, but what they separated me from the group. I was mixed in with everybody and didn't know any better. Uh, I, I, but when we boarded the train, the troop train to Chicago, I was riding Pullman service. Had a bed all night and all this. And all those white sailors were sitting up in the coaches. And I said, well, maybe this ain't so bad. <laughs> this just might be all right. When I joined the Navy, went in the recruiting office, they immediately took me in, and we went through the physical. We swore in and went through the physical. And uh, I was among a lot of sailors, a lot of recruits, and uh, all of them were white, as far as I know. And uh, we were all in, in this examining room in the nude. And we were going from doctor to doctor, having various tests. And they'd give us papers to fill out. And uh, one of these papers asked for ancestry. And so not being aware and, and thinking about 
prejudice or race or anything like that. I just put down German, Irish, Indian, and Negro in the in the percentage uh, uh, order. And as we went through the line, they were testing, examining each entry. Each guy would examine a different part of it. We came to this one guy, and uh, he was studying my papers, and all of a sudden, he looked up and glared at me, and he had a real frown on his face, and he examined me very carefully, and he reached over and got a red pen and wrote on the front of my jacket in over an inch high letters, Negro. And I was immediately ushered out of the group of white sailors and put into a group of black sailors. And then I was ushered to Great Lakes and put into a segregated camp. The men came from all over the country. I was born in a little place in Lake City, South Carolina. I think the population was under 10,000. James Graham and his family lived on the premises of the Imperial Tobacco Company, where his father, George, was the caretaker, a key position in a county that depended on tobacco and cotton for its livelihood. He attended a segregated school. Lunch came from home or was bought at the penny candy store. But I used to, while I was a kid, I used to work at the Imperial where Mr. George was at. A lot of fun because there wasn't much to do. So we got on the train going to Chicago, Great Lakes, Illinois. The older guys, they were smoking and drinking and lying, and we fell right into it. Just a few miles away from James Graham's home, Benjamin Garrison lived on Wheeler Hill in Columbia, South Carolina. All life, almost everything was segregated. Uh, waiting rooms at the train stations, bus stations, drinking fountains, theaters. Much has changed there, but some neighbors remain. And this church, here since before the Civil War. This house is similar to the house I was born in. With all its uh, inconveniences, it was a pretty good place to live. It, it, it was a rigid system of segregation throughout the South. But I wasn't as aware of it then until I went into the Navy and, and mingled with other people and saw that how things should be or could be. In 1942, even in cosmopolitan New Orleans, segregation placed limits. In New Orleans, uh, when you ride on the public transportation, they had what was known as a screen. It was a little board fit in the back of the seats, and uh, you had to sit behind that because it would indicate for colored people, and you sat behind that. Lorenzo Dufour still visits Carrollton, where the house he was born in still stands. And the remarkable thing, the house is still here. It, it was here before I was born, and it's still here. It just, it does an emotional thing to me and the church where he worshiped still inspires. 919 Adams Street, the home of the First Permission Baptist Church. Great Lakes would be a colder climate. Kansas City, Kansas, I was living in Kansas City, Kansas. Dining car way there, troop trains. Pick them up in Arlington, Union Pacific, and take them out to Frisco, or Los Angeles, to take the boat to go over and fight. So I volunteered for the Navy. Can you imagine that? Volunteering for the Navy. And I was making mucho money. Beaucoup l'argent. My dad had been in the Army in World War I. And during my formative years, my dad had, in way of chastising me, would tell me any time I did anything wrong, if you were in the Army, you wouldn't be doing this, or you would not have done this. And so I resolved that uh, after hearing this for some 17 years, that I was not going to be in the Army. My family was a large family. There were nine of us, nine of us children, and uh, we were very poor. And so my mother decided to move us to Michigan uh, about
around 125 miles from Chicago so that we could live in a rural climate because my parents were both from the farm and uh, in Mississippi and they were able to uh, raise crops so in the depression uh, they took us up there so we could raise our own food and that way we could survive. Men from the north traveled shorter distances but still entered a different world. Each had his own motivations. I graduated from Proviso High School in Maywood, Illinois. I had had the uh, experience of being in the CMTC, the CCCs, and I found out that sleeping on the ground wasn't my idea of the way to spend the war. So, <laughs> so I uh, opted for the Navy, where we slept between clean sheets practically every night and got three hot squares a day under most conditions. I was just drafted. I always wanted to be a sailor. I don't know why, but I did. So I was happy when I got in for drafted. I was, what, 30 years old when I went into the Navy. <laughs> I was born in Harlem. I did a lot of modeling as a kid, uh, planes, anything I had. And then just before the war, I was modeling ships. And I got in the habit of leaving high school, stopping by the big public library we had here in Jamaica, and looking up in Jane's fighting ships. And I'd make my little drawings, take, out, take all the information down, go home, draw it up to the scale, and then I would build that. I had over 200 models of ships, loved the ships. By, by March, I was working downtown as a delivery, delivery boy, and uh, I would see the ships in the harbor because the war had just began, and that was by March. And I just had to get in the Navy with all these ships. Oh, that's all I wanted to do, go to sea. Here I'm living in New York, I gotta go to sea. All headed for the Navy's giant training camp at Great Lakes, Illinois. Black recruits were separated, kept across the tracks, at a facility named for the man who fought for the nation, conceived in liberty and founded on the principle that all men are created equal, Robert Smalls. But when I went to, uh, from Columbia, South Carolina, to Great Lakes Naval Training Station, uh, we were in a segregated training camp, Camp Robert Smalls. There they were all blacks, except that the instructors were white officers were white. For the most part, the men accepted the separation and went about the business of learning to be seamen. Everything that went on in Camp Robert Small had to do with Camp Robert Small. We were, well, I guess I could say kind of ostracized from the rest of the Great Lakes, and Great Lakes was a big training center at the time. The conditions under which we lived and worked weren't, were not bad, though. We had built up a determination among us. We used to sort of police ourselves to see that nobody make us look bad. There were compensations. Musicians such as Dorothy Donegan, singers such as Paul Robeson, lifted morale. Lena Horn came. President Roosevelt's valet, George Fields, was now a rated Navy man. Marvel Lewis attended graduation along with her famous husband, Joe. Intramural athletic games, matches against Chicago teams, and visits to what one man called the best liberty town in the world helped. The people of Chicago, especially members of its vibrant black community, welcomed the man. Chicago was quite excited about us being there too, you know. They achieved great success and qualified for jobs black sailors had not been permitted to do and took up assignments on shore stations. They put me on a um, patrol boat and we was going out on a regular basis out on the coast of uh, New Jersey. I was out and I said to the, I said to the officer, I, I was steering the ship, uh, what happens if we do see a, a submarine? He says, we ram. We set the depth charges at 30 feet and we ram. And I said, where are we going to be when we ram with this little piece of wood against a submarine? He said, it'll be in the water. I said, when the depth charges go, go off, where are we going to be? 
He said, well, we have to figure that out. I really wanted a warship. That's what I was looking for. Because I wanted to be a part of the seagoing Navy as opposed to being land-based. These sailors were young and highly trained. They wanted a ship. Again, pressure was brought. This time, even President Roosevelt resisted. Surely, he wrote Frank Knox, Secretary of the Navy, we can keep these men busy on shore. But again, there was a secret weapon, the First Lady. We were called Eleanor's Folly. The, the whole Mason was, uh, was pushed by Eleanor Roosevelt. And so, finally, the great day dawned. And soon, these teenage kids from Harlem and Lake City, Chicago and Columbia, Providence and Cleveland, were the men of the Mason with their own credo. So when you meet up with the, Ma with the Mason, please select your chatter well, for if you should use some slander, Jack, you've got a home in hell. There were more shoreside indignities in the U.S. Charles Divers recalls Norfolk. Coming back from uh, Liberty one night, uh, myself and a bunch of Marines and uh, sailors were waiting on the Charlie. And when the Charlie came up, we all climbed aboard, and, uh, and the Charlie just sat there. <laughs> so the guys all howled, hey, Mac, let's get this thing going. We got to get back to the base. The guy said, I can't move this Charlie until that fella gets to the rear. And uh, he said, get to the rear? What do you mean? He said, well, all the niggers got to go to the rear. So he said, how's he going to get to the rear? He said, well, he'll have to get off then. So I, I said, well, what the heck is this? So I said, well, I didn't want to make it tough on the rest of the guys, so I'll, so I'll get off, catch the next Charlie. I'll be first in line. I can get to the rear. And those guys said, no way, Mac. You stay right aboard. And they took the tiller away from that guy on the Charlie and threw the conductor off, and they took the thing all the way, nonstop, all the way to the base. <laughs> so, and uh, we didn't have... No problems with those guys after that. But when they shoved off, such incidents diminished before the immensity of sea and sky. They had a captain they respected, brothers in arms they trusted, and a world in front of them. Hitler, Hugo, Luftwaffe. It was the enemy that had better watch out. The Mason had entered the war. We couldn't go to a movie show or sit down to a counter in Woolworths, even. We had to go around to the back. Then, next thing you know, we were on a ship. We're scared, and we go to Ireland. This was on display and the people and didn't even look at us as our skin color. color. They looked at us as true American, American fighting men. Oh, our first our maiden voice was into uh, Belfast. Belfast. That, was our, that was our last stop. That's right. It was the maiden voice and took us 42 days. days. There's always a question in your mind what you're going to meet, how the people will greet you. Because here we were so many black guys, it was 160 of us on one ship. Whenever you go in any place, the captain always say, don't go alone. Be two or three together and stay together no matter what. So we are apprehensive at first. But then when these greetings start coming our way without any effort. You see, sometimes when we talk about Ireland and how well we were received, you might get the idea that it was a novel experience for them. But if I'm not mistaken, I'm told that some black soldiers, yeah, had, soldiers had been there prior to yeah, our yeah, arrival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our coming in was not a novel experience. It was their normal way of treating people. That's what I'm impressed about. One thing I noticed, that the girls, they were beautiful. <laughs> they didn't wear any lipstick. No type of makeup, not one. And, and this was like in June of 44. There's a girl sitting here, and I'm on one side, and another shipmate on the other side. And I had never learned to dance, but it, everybody was dancing. So somebody came over and asked this girl for a dance, to dance. And she turned to me and said, may I dance with him? Now, that made an impression on me, showed me how courteous she courteous, was. Yes, was and I, that's why I remember her name, Sadie O'Neill. I never forgot it. The men attended Cayley's, where native dances were performed. And she said, did you ever hear of the blacker? And I heard that word black, see? My ears perked up. I said, what'd you say? She said, you ever hear of the blacker? The blacker? 
and the other guy said, I'm asking, what is she saying, man? What is she saying? She said, no, my lap calling me black something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, no, she wants to know if you ever heard of the blackout. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, sure, New York, we have plenty of blackouts and all like that. And then we danced around in the beach. I couldn't dance, yeah, I but I danced around in that circle. The circle, you go one way. Yeah. This way, the circle. Then all of a sudden, a beat from the band, and everybody started going the other way, and then you fall over each other until I got used to it. I waited and listened for the beat, and when they went this way, I went this way. <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely. It was really yeah. beautiful. I, I thought that was wonderful. It made us feel good, all of us. The most impressive thing for me was to meet people on the street, perfect strangers, <clears throat> and how they walked up and Straight greeted us. And it was such a shocker to me, because the ordeal that we're going to in our own U.S. Navy, to get over there and these people, first time meeting us, came up with such courtesy. And they, they, one lady apologized for the weather being cloudy. Yeah. Apologized for the weather being cloudy. You know, it, how, how, uh, just, just, just to be treated like that. We had to travel all that distance to be exposed to that kindness. Just, just human kindness that came out of those people's hearts. <coughs> And when you contrast that with the way we were treated on the ferry that ran from, well, there's a ferry from Norfolk to Newport News or Chesapeake Bay. And I was sitting there in a lunch counter with one of my shipmates who was white. And I, we both ordered. Uh, the woman looked at me kind of strangely, but she gave me what I wanted. But then a little man about this big came out and said to me, he used the N-word, told me that I should not be there and get up in uniform. When I got to Ireland, like I say, it was the only place that I was called a Yank and knew it. That's what they meant. They didn't say tan Yank like they did in other spots of the, where we'd been. They called me Yank. The same thing as what the white sailors was being called, Yank. And it was good. Accompanying them on their first voyage was Thomas W. Young, the first African-American war correspondent ever to sail on a Navy ship. He headlined his article, Irish, first to treat Mason crew as American. Young also described the tense moments of general quarters. When the gong begins to ring, and a voice on the public address system sternly orders, all hands, man your battle stations. Well you tingle just a bit inside because you don't know then how far away the enemy is or in what strength he will strike. One of the most fearsome moments came when the ship rammed. What? Each has his own opinion. They always have somebody out the back to watch the back end of the convoy. When we was back there that night, no light, just some stars in the sky, pitch black. And this is where the wolf packs would uh, congregate and they would get shipping going in and shipping coming out of the Mediterranean through the straits there. I come on duty at quarter to 12 at midnight, and uh, in about five minutes, I picked up this contact at 3,000 yards. And in all my training, this was a classic submarine contact. I heard the, uh, the Sonnerman uh, calling ranges in bearings. And I'm listening, we're finding it and we're losing it. And the radar pick it up and find it and lose it. And we were tracked right in on it. And the captain kept going, right, he had it all set and the depth charge is all set, the ship is at battle station. Just before we got to the target, I pushed the button. We shoot off the depth charges, the K guns are going, and it's, oh, it looks like big yellow Christmas trees, huge Christmas trees, and they're blowing up all over the place. I'm standing up there, and I'm 40 feet off the water on a ship, a 1,400-ton ship, and I feel this thing like a, somebody hit me with a baseball bat under my feet. We slammed into something, and these things were going off, and then everything got quiet. The lights went out, and it was just completely silent. And I knew it wasn't, uh, it had to be a submarine, because I could feel it roll as it went under the ship. And then eventually the skipper came on the PA system and said, this is your captain speaking. 
I think we got Red Dog. And we referred to the German wolf packs as Red Dog. And so we, uh, we all were jubilant that we had sunk a German submarine or felt we had, junk, had uh, sunk a German submarine. So now I go down, I'm set down to the fly, uh, to the signal bridge, do falls on the signal bridge, and the, the officers are leaning over and talking to us because they want it lit up and they don't want it lit too long. So we turn on a 12-inch light, lit up the whole ocean, and oh, Lord, I said, if that's a submarine, we got it. And I see these huge beams sticking out of the water, huge beams. I've never seen beams like that even here on when they're doing construction. <clears throat> And we realized we got some sunken derly. I never questioned that it was a submarine. This dumb thing we ran into. But all agree on the most horrific of all their trips, Convoy NY-119. The war diary for October 16th, 1944 sets the scene. Screening starboard bow as before. Wind and sea rising, many breakdowns reported by small craft and increasing difficulty with tow wires. Some alarm noted in TBS transmission. Some alarm? That understated the case. The Mason crew had spent the past 30 days trying to drag a convoy of unwieldy yard tugs, leaky barges, massive car floats, and the huge oiler, Maumee, across the Atlantic. 19th century sailing ships made the passage in a week. The Queen Mary had passed them four times. The convoy was averaging less than five miles an hour. Any man on the ship could walk faster than that. We spent over 30 days on the water with that one convoy that had a speed of about 4.5 knots. That's less than five miles an hour. The Mason with their four sister DEs circled the slow-moving ships prodding stragglers, patrolling their sectors, listening for the sonar contacts that could mean U-boats, keeping station, protecting their ungainly herd. The weather had been terrible, but that was the norm in the North Atlantic in mid-autumn. Winds of 20 miles per hour, seas from 10 to 20 feet. In the North Atlantic, when water hits the deck, the steel deck, it turns to ice immediately. That's how cold it is. And uh, we call, people call, uh, ropes. We call them lines. If a line is about that big, by the time the ice hits it, it gets like that. The decks are very slippery, and you have to—you can't walk upright. You have to time it because the ship is rolling and pitching and up and down, and you have to time it. If you fall overboard, you're finished. Finished. You, you couldn't survive. But then, on October 10th, the velocity increased. Winds were 30 to 40 miles per hour. Gusts measured 90 miles per hour. Seas ran at 40 or 50 feet. Now the barges themselves became agents of destruction, swinging wildly from their toes, fraying the lines, dragging down the small crash that pulled against them. Two had capsized. The Mason crew joined the other DEs in the scramble to rescue the men trapped in the sinking ships. They had pulled most of them aboard, but others had gone down to the sea bottom. One of the destroyer escorts, in an attempt to rescue some men, the ship came up and came down on them and so killed some of them, too. It was tragic. Uh, ships were lost, uh, lives of people were lost, and, uh, you know, we would, uh, we would discuss these things uh, at Chow, you know, what ships went down, and, and uh, how many people had been lost, and wondering if the next day is going to bring the same kind of thing. But as I said earlier, at that age, you, you think you're invincible, you know, and you don't really give a lot of thought to, to dying. Uh, you think that you're going to live forever and you're going to survive anything that comes along. And, uh, and that's pretty much the way I think most of the people aboard that ship felt. Now the Mason itself was endangered. The men had fought their way across 3,000 miles of rampaging seas. All signs pointed to worsening weather. Convoy commander Alfred Lynn faced a decision. Should the convoy huddle together and try to ride out the storm as a unit? Or should he detach the 20 small manned vessels and let them make for the shelter of nearby land at their best speed? 
he would be asking the small craft to struggle to shore without adequate escort protection or service vessels. But to keep the small ships at sea meant almost certain disaster. They could overturn, and in such seas, how could he count on a successful rescue? Jim Graham in the radio shack waited for the message. Charles Divers in the wheelhouse watched the incrometer, which measured the degrees the ship rolled. We were taking 70 degree rolls. I was in the wheelhouse. And uh, I see the incrometer roll over to 70 degrees. And I thought we were never going to come back up right, right itself. We go over, we just lay there, and all of a sudden she'd ease off and come back up. She came back up, water pouring down into the engine room below decks. Lorenzo Dufour and Gordon Buchanan stood by their signal lights. The message came. The Mason would form a new convoy with 20 vessels. The Mason would get these faster vessels to Plymouth and then return with British ships to help the rest of the convoy bring in the tugs and barges. The fog and clouds were so dense, they almost lost their way. Buchanan remembers. I was on the bridge with the executive officer, Lieutenant Ross, and I spotted the star. And we went down and got the, the, the section and uh, took a time. And then we went in the chart and we made the lines and we was parallel to each other on the line. We figured we had it right. And we gave it to the captain. The captain radio over to the commodore of the convoy. And when we did come out from under the cloud cover for after quite a while, we found out ours was exactly where we were at the time. They headed into the wind. Captain Blackwood called on the engine room, on every seaman. Then, with shore in sight, the deck of the Mason split. Two men went on deck and repaired the break. The, the seam was such that the water was going into the after cruise quarter from the deck, from the man deck. And we didn't realize it then, but afterwards, the damage control officer said if he had ignored that seam, the ship could have split right across. They made it into port. After two hours of repairs, the Mason turned back to the sea to aid the convoy that still foundered in the storm. Two British vessels were ordered to accompany the DE. The three ships started together. The British stopped and returned to port. The USS Mason stayed at sea for three more days, assisting 12 ships of the convoy. She was ordered to shelter from another storm, but on the 24th of October, to the 27th, she worked to salvage barges off the French coast. In his official report to the head of naval operations, Commodore Lind wrote, Commander of the task group considers the performance of the USS Mason, her commanding officer and men outstanding, and recommends that this ship be given a letter of commendation to be filed in the record of each officer and man on board that vessel. Receiving such an honor would have been a high point for the crew and front page news in papers throughout the black community in the U.S. Negro Blue Jacket Heroes, the headlines would have read. What a moment to savor. But the commendations never came. So there were no headlines. In fact, when the crew finally were granted liberty and headed for England, where rumor had it there were hot dogs, mustard, and Coca-Cola, they were turned away, whites only. We hadn't had Coca-Cola and hot dogs and mustard since we left the States. And I think about three or four of us were together, found the canteen, went up the steps excited, of getting hot dogs, and a lady told us that wasn't our canteen. We traveled 3,000 miles and found out J.C. was there ahead of us. J.C. among us, J Jim Crow. Although the Mason crew faced problems on shore from white sailors, convoy duty demanded that each man concentrate on his job and left little time for personal conflict. But when the USS Mason returned to the States, submerged tensions surfaced. By the time the Mason was decommissioned, the chief petty officers were black. But some of the first white chiefs had a different idea of their place on the USS Mason. The captain was aware, was fully aware of the conflict we was in because 
At one time, we had some chief petty officers. A couple of them had the nerve to tell the captain that as long as you keep them in their place, everything would be all right. So <laughs> the captain wanted to know what you mean, in their place. Well, they didn't want them up around cap uh, Chief Petty Officer's quarters. And there was a couple of other requests they made that just didn't fit in with Navy regs, and it didn't fit in with the captain operating a ship. It was going to be a disharmony aboard his ship, which he was going to tolerate. And the very next day, Scuttlebutt had it go hang out on the boat deck because the yeoman was about to read some orders. And he read them orders that they was being transferred from there to the receiving station in New York for future orders. And one of those guys, before he left that ship, he spewed out his hatred to the men. He didn't give a sword, so what happened to them? He hoped when we get out there, some submarine would hit us and destroy every one of us. So one of the guys said, we love you, Chief. The USS Mason shepherded three more convoys across the Atlantic to Oran, Algeria in the spring of 1945. The U-boats made a final frantic effort to impede the Allied armies advancing across Germany by staunching the continuous procession of ships. But victory for the Allies was in the air. The men found Algeria both exotic and welcoming. But even as the men picnicked on the beach, the poverty of the Algerian people disturbed them and they devised ways to get around the rules against giving food to the people. They met the African soldiers serving with the French army and visited the Casbah. We saw the women with the veil. We were told not to bother them at all. And of course, we didn't bother them, but we were curious. On the way home, after one such trip, the great news came. The war in Europe was over. The crew expected to be sent to the Pacific but first, James W. Graham had a particular duty. He was to marry a special woman who was practically a shipmate. Well, I think it was one morning I was coming off of duty, and uh, Skinny is my brother-in-law. He had uh, Bob's picture on his bunk writing a letter, and I saw it, and I said, uh, who is that? He said, that's my sister. I said, is? And he said, yes. I said, do you mind if I write her a letter? He said, no. <laughs> so I wrote her a letter. And we've been together ever since. Uh, you know, uh, could he ask me, could he write to my sister? And I said, yeah, yeah, that's a little big deal. We was all sailors together, no problem. But that correspondence kept up without my knowing it. But eventually he came to my home, met my sister and everything, so that turned out pretty nice. I am Barbara Buchanan Graham, and I'm married to James Warren Graham, who served on board the USS Mason DE-529 as radioman second class served well, I might say. And I say that I'm Barbara Buchanan Graham to bring this into play here, because the Buchanan that served with my husband was my brother, Gordon Buchanan. And he brought Ray home to me. Guess he thought his sister wasn't going to get a fella. But he brought him home. And uh, I like what I saw. And I was young and foolish, but I still like what I saw. In the midst of reunions with wives and families, they had one sorrow. Captain Blackford was leaving, promoted to a higher post. They would miss his great seamanship, his humanity. Blackford treated us like men. He, he accepted us uh, what, for what we were. He gave us responsibilities and we handled them. He had utmost confidence in us like we had in him. Their new captain, Norman Meyer, saw the men differently. He offered to teach them to read and write. He would spend less than three months on the Mason. What the men remember most is the two times he crashed into another ship. Two of the Navy's brand new black officers came aboard under Captain Meyer, James Hare and John Clarence McIntosh. By this time, the war was over for the Mason. Most of the men left the Navy behind but then I got the attitude that, that I was going to get shipped to uh, Norfolk. He said, you can be a chief yeoman six months. When I said, no way, 
no way. I said you could make me an admiral, and I wouldn't stay in this man's Navy. Those who stayed celebrated Harry Truman's Executive Order 9981 on July 26, 1948. It ended segregation in the armed forces. They all led busy lives, and only in later years did the men begin to wonder why they never read anything about the Mason. Had the Navy forgotten its black pioneers? The Mason was decommissioned in 1945, and it was sold, sold for scrap in 1947, but there were never anything in any of the uh, newspapers about the Mason or anything. And I used to watch the uh, documentaries on World War II all the time, and I had to look from beginning to end. I never saw a black face in it. We were programmed to fail. We weren't expected to succeed, see? And when we start proving them wrong and succeeding, rather than eat crow, they downplay all our accomplishments and all our virtues and everything. And uh, that's why we, till this day, nobody, very few people know about the accomplishments of the Mason. James Graham decided that their story must be told. They must do it. It would be a crime that we would pass through history without ever the uh, children, uh, grandchildren and so forth ever knowing about the Mason. He searched for former shipmates and organized reunions. They found their captain's son, Mansell Blackford. The Mason crew became active members of the Destroyer Escort Sailors Association. They helped to bring back and renovate one of the last existing DEs in the world. I treat it just like it was my ship during the war. Russ has to go. I learned of my grandmother's role in the Mason through following her career uh, over the years, but uh, this is the first occasion that I've had to meet with gentlemen who had served on that historic ship, and it really was an, an historic ship. On October 16, 1994, James Graham completed his last mission. President William Jefferson Clinton presented James Graham, president of the USS Mason Association, with a plaque that acknowledged the crew's pioneering role in the Navy. He commended their service in combat. For decades, African-American veterans were missing in our nation's memories of World War II. For too long, you were soldiers in the shadows, forgotten heroes. Today, it should be clear to all of you, you were forgotten. USS Mason Association, James Graham. Perhaps the Mason's greatest day came not at sea, but on that other commissioning day at Annapolis, when their spiritual grandchildren stepped up to claim their gold braid. The USS Mason had finally come home. History and the book. Isaiah's words echo. Your heart will overflow. The glory of the sea will shine before you. And you shall be at peace. How proudly they served.
our brethren shield in danger zone from rock and tempest fire and foe protect 